I want to point out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Welcome to Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. Um, we are doing the May 1st Energy Week show, and now what we're dealing with is the news. We ate the dessert first. We ate the dessert first. We sure <laughs> did. Okay. So I'm just going to uh, go right in. Do you speak any Arabic? Shway, shway. Ah, that's as, all, that's as much as you've got? Okay. Um, uh, from the 25th of, uh, of April... We have this from Al uh, Arabia. Al yeah. Arabia. Al Arabia. Yeah. Arabia. Al Arabia. The okay. Ar the Arabic people. Right? Okay. Um, Africa's largest wind farm at Tarfaya in southwestern Morocco has started generating electricity and will be capable of meeting the electric needs of several hundred thousand people. Officials say it has a capacity of 300 megawatts. They don't use as much power there as they do in the United States. They're catching up. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's catching up. I mean, I find it ironic. I mean, here's, here's all these companies with our oil underneath their sand, and we're using up all the oil, stealing it from them. And what have they got left? Sun. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well. They're going to be set for the next thousand years. I think so. Or longer. As a matter of fact, I've read some projections where they're actually talking about super solar farms in the Sahara. Yes. Pumping the energy up into Europe. Into Europe, which would give the people in the in the in Africa an opportunity to continue their dominance of the energy market. In Africa. People in in the Middle East. In the Middle East, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my whole. Point. They have a they have a, an area down there called the MENA, Middle East North Africa. Yep. And uh, that's that's what they're working on. They're trying to get as much power going. The, the uh, Saudis are putting in a lot of power from sun, and I think they're putting in wind power too. And I could, oh, yeah. I should, Absolutely. I would imagine that the desert there would be able to produce quite a lot. They don't have a lot of cloud there. Well, wind power is a natural. Yeah. They have a. Uh, they name the winds over there, you know. Yeah. And they have a wind called a shamal. Yeah. And for about nine months of the year, the shamal blows steadily, 24-7. Yeah. And it's not going to blow you over, but it's a steady wind. It's, yeah. It's steady. Yeah. It's probably the only thing that makes living outdoors even doable. Huh. If they didn't have that wind, it'd be, you know, 114 degrees out. If you didn't have a wind blowing on you, you'd fall right over. Yeah. But it works. I mean, it's... Um, they've lived there for a couple of thousand years. They didn't have air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. From UPI.com, we have this. Solar power now accounts for about 1.1% of total capacity in the United States electric grid, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. In, a, uh, in its monthly report on electric generation in the U, uh, U.S. grid. Now, this is grid power, which means that anybody who's off-grid is not included. Mm -hmm. Solar power has a, had a 418% increase in capacity since 2010. Okay. Um, I would warn everybody, um, the U.S., uh, um, the EIA, Energy Information Administration, is notorious for producing numbers that are wrong. <laughs> but this is what they're saying. I mean, they, they projected a, an amount of, of renewable power might be achieved by 2035 that had already, in, in 2013, they made the projection and the amount had already been achieved. Had already, but that's right, you know, I read that. And this, is, this is a real problem but you know they ha they're they're constrained in their projections um, to follow certain formulas and the formulas don't work for real projections next from renewable energy magazine con ed solutions and the port authority of new york and new jersey unveiled 
one of four new solar installations at Newark Liberty International Airport. It is a 633 kilowatt PV system, the first at any airport buildings operated by the Port Authority. That's, that's fairly good sized. Well, Newark Airport's a big airport now. It is. I remember it when it was like one big room. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. I used to fly out of Newark a lot because Did you? you didn't have to wait in line. Yeah. You I go was... to Kennedy, you go to LaGuardia, and you know, it was all crowded. Nobody went to Newark. Yeah. Of course, you couldn't get anywhere. <laughs> well, I, I used to go into Newark because I lived in New Jersey at the time, and you know, I'd pick up relatives or whatever, and, and they would come in to uh, Newark from nowhere because that's where you went and to and from. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was fortunate because I had a lot of business in Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. And it was regular flights from Newark to Pittsburgh. Yeah, I believe it, yeah. Anyway, that was uh, all on the 25th, and uh, on the 26th we have this. Rooftop solar are the grids really needed? This is an opinion piece from Clean Technica. Being off-grid in the outback makes economic sense, but the bigger question for network operators around the world is whether those in more populated area, even cities, will look to adopt similar measures. I was going to comment on that. I read that. This, this is very interesting. Yeah. Because as you know, <clears throat> Australia is very sparsely populated because yep. it's a very large com country with and they're finding out that all of this electrification they did in the 20th century was costing them an awful lot of money. You know, when, when there's five miles, ten miles between a house and they have to run the pole lines, it cost them a lot of money to put them in, but of course the government paid for it because it was a rural electrification thing. Mm -hmm. But now they're maintaining these pole lines. Mm -hmm. And it's, they're looking at it and saying, we're not getting the income. Forget about the profit, the income. Yeah. to pay for these lines. So now they're coming up with a new plan which looks likely that it will be implemented. Is they're going to have regional generating with wind or solar that's going to take care of a small area and they're going to tie everything together and it's not going to be connected to the, uh, to the major grid. Or some of, in some cases it so might be. They're looking at big sized microgrids. Spread out over the country. Spread out, yeah, yeah, but they're still microgrids. And, yeah. and they're doing it just because it's really about the only way to make sense. Yeah, and, and the interesting thing about this is that people who are into, into electric transmission in Australia are trying to do this. The people who are operating coal-burning plants are kind of at odds with them. The government <laughs> is at odds. The government is very profoundly against renewable power. It's basically... You know, their 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 person on point for renewable power is a is a climate change denier. <laughs> I mean, this is it's well. We <clears throat> don't really understand how powerful the coal lobby is in Australia, and it's been powerful for probably since there's been in Australia. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening. Yeah. Well, you've got a huge area that has huge mineral resources, and not very many people. Exactly. So that is, is um, really, it, it kind of explains Australian um, politics. To a very great degree, yeah. very great degree. Okay, also... This too will change. Yes, it will. <laughs> also from Clean Technica, we got this in, uh, on the same date, the 26th. In yet another signal that the era of fossil fuels is drawing to a close, a jury just awarded a whopping $3 million to a Texas family for health and property impacts linked to a nearby Aruba Petroleum fracking yep. operation. Yep. And those poor people had very real problems that developed from chemicals that <clears throat> existed in their environment. And um, I don't know how much farther that's going to go, but... Well, it's pretty likely that it'll be appealed. The uh, uh, fracking company's denying it. Yes. Any, we, we're not responsible. That's for not any us. That. We're meeting state standards. Da 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 da. Yeah. Da. Right. And it remains to be seen who's got the better lawyer. Well, the the thing though is, regardless of what happens in this particular case, you know that the case is going to be repeated. Oh yeah. Other people will do the same thing, and when they see a three million dollar award, they'll probably be flocks of people going to that to uh, to uh, 
make up for their losses. Now, there's something similar going on right now in Texas. Yes. Where there's a lawsuit being launched against the wind company. Mm -hmm. And the guy that's pushing the lawsuit is the president of the electric company. Yes. <laughs> well... <laughs> I thought what I had something say? on that one, but I can't find it. Okay. Um, the next same yeah, day. I, I got it here, I think. What's that? Oh, yeah, I remember that picture. That's a beautiful picture. No, this isn't the same article. Okay. It's Exelon, but it's not the same article. Okay. Um, GE Energy Financial Services announced it has exceeded $10 billion dollars in renewable energy investment commitments worldwide to become one of the in industry's leading investors. The projects avoid greenhouse gases equivalent to the annual emissions of all the cars in Massachusetts. That's from GE. That's taken a while <clears throat> to settle down there. Yeah, yeah. That's, a lot of, that's a lot of stuff though. Okay, moving on, on the um, <clears throat> 27th, we got this from Clean Technica, a new report from New York State where a de facto shale drilling moratorium has persisted since 2008 and concludes that unless natural gas prices double, much of the shale gas in the state cannot be profitably accessed by oil and gas companies. They can't get it. They can't get it unless the price go doubles. Now this is you so know this is some some other thing happening. Yeah, this, this is this is economic. This again. is the other reason <clears throat> yeah. why there's a why there's an oil bubble or a fossil fuel bubble, a carbon bubble. It's not because pressure is coming from the United Nations or from nations, but because uh, to stop global warming, but because they're it costs too much. It costs too much, yeah. and when the price of natural gas doubles, and we compare that with the cost of renewable resources, for example, um, electricity from solar and wind driving heat pumps to heat houses instead of using natural gas. You're going to change the whole picture. Yeah, the, the picture changes. I just got that article. Which article? The one I just read? <laughs> Fracking impacts on property rights and home values. This oh, okay. Drilling yeah. versus the American dream. It's a short article here, <clears throat> or at least I made it short. <laughs> look, look no further than Exxon CEO and board chairman Rex Tillerson, who was suing to stop construction of a water tower that would supply nearby drilling operations because of the nuisance of, among other things, heavy truck traffic, noise and traffic hazards from the fracking operation a tower would support. That's right. The head of the single largest drilling company in the world acknowledges the constant and unbearable nuisance that would come from having lights on at all hours of the night, traffic at unreasonable hours, noise from mechanical and electrical equipment. Tellingly, Tillerson's lawsuit filled in 2012 with other plaint plaintiffs, including former House Majority Leader Dick Armey, <laughs> claims the project would do irreparable harm to his property value. Well, it's, it, it, it probably will, but it won't do any harm to people who live in tiny villages in North, Carolina, in North uh, Dakota. Or in North Texas. Or North Texas, you know, <laughs> because their property has no value. So we can <laughs> diminish the, the, the uh, value. I mean, There's I don't know. a little bit of hypocrisy there. A little bit of hypocrisy, yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um, also on the 27th from Biomass Magazine, I, I always get the feeling that there rep these people report news that is just really kind of slanted toward their own point of view. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> I think you're, you're a conspiracy here. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I believe in a conspiracy of, of, um, of uh, what, is, what is going on, motivating <laughs> pe many people to do the same thing. Um, each for his own identical reason. There are choices for biogas projects about uh, what to do with the gas. They're generating gas mm -hmm. from a biogas project, mm -hmm. say a farm uh, uh, biodigester. You get gas, what do you do with it? Well, typically what they do today is they burn it in some kind of internal combustion machine to make mm -hmm. fuel, uh, as fuel. Mm -hmm. but. Here, a, develop, a developer may produce power for sale to the grid, but there is an increasing appeal 
to use it to replace natural gas offsetting fuel costs. New chemical processes make that conversion easier. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff in biogas that you want to get out of it. Car carbon dioxide being one of the culprits. Mm -hmm. Other culprits are sulfur dioxide and the stuff that smells bad. Yeah, and there's a there's a set of um, silicon compounds, and I, f I forget the name of them, but they can they don't always, but they can come out of these operations, and they make it really hard to use this in place of natural gas. Mm -hmm. But if you can scrub it mm -hmm. so that it be becomes all right. So that's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. And that thing about the price of natural gas doubling in order to get the fracking yeah. uh, going, it, with this stuff, the price of natural gas goes up, which it almost certainly will. These guys can make some money doing that, just taking the biogas and putting it right into the, um, the gas lines. And this is something that, for example, Middlebury College is doing this. They're, they're taking the biodigesters that they've got 10 miles away, mm -hmm. and what they had been doing, what they had originally planned, was to have those, that gas compressed and trucked to, to Middlebury College. Okay. But, but what they're doing instead is they're taking advantage of this gas pipeline that's going on in, in between Rutland and um, Ticonderoga. Ticonderoga. Which and isn't a fait accompli. No, it's not. But they're hoping yeah. Middlebury College, which is all that green, is hoping that that, that, that project, if it goes in, will give them the give ability... Give them a different option. Right, instead of driving a truck back and forth. Mm -hmm. And that means that they could take natural gas out of a pipeline and put natural gas into the pipeline elsewhere and reduce their costs. So, you know, we've got a, we've got a, a lot. This is not a, an easy issue. No, things are <clears throat> different forces are working against each other here. Yeah, and might end up working together. Well, that would be that'd be good. Yeah. Okay. Um so that from Biomass Magazine on the 28th of April uh from a, a publication called The Australian there's so much news coming out of Australia. People in Australia, you know, they, th this is an issue for them. They're fighting over it. Oh, yeah. Um, in Australia, up to four billion worth of gas-fired power stations are in danger of being stranded as gas prices explode and the renewable energy target pushes extra generation into the grid already oversupplied with excess power, a new report has found. Now, <clears throat> the United States is the only place where this fracked gas is really hitting the market at reduced prices. Yeah, it's not, that's correct. In yeah. Germany, they have natural gas. They don't want to use it. They mm -hmm. went, to, went to coal because it's cheaper, and now they want to stay with coal because of the situation in the Ukraine. And throughout Europe, we're given an opportunity. The voters are expressing their will that they don't frack. That's right, yeah. They would much rather have wind turbines mm -hmm. right next to them than fracking mm -hmm. going on under their feet. So this is an issue, and uh, it's it's um, it's. Uh, the, I think people should be aware of the fact that the U.S. gas situation is. I think it's a bubble. I think it cannot continue the way that it is. Well, the problem is, as I see it, we've got this gas. We don't have the infrastructure to get it to market. So what are they going to do with it? The price is going down to encourage people to use it. Right. They're still dying to build the infrastructure, but that isn't going to happen overnight. Right. We're talking <clears throat> 10, 15 years before they can get this stuff to boats where they can bring it over to Europe. Right. And I don't, just because of the time element, I don't think it's going to happen. Well, the other thing, too, is it takes a, it takes a long time to convert a coal plant to natural gas or to build a new natural gas plant. And if you were a banker and, and I came to you and said, I want a billion dollars to build a natural gas plant, before you loaned me the money, you would say, okay, what's going to happen to the future of the price of natural gas? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to the future of price of electricity? And, you know, is this a safe investment? Absolutely. And if, if, if you have another person saying, I want to come to you, I, I'm, I want you to min, lend me a billion dollars for wind or for solar. 
you're going to ask exactly the same questions, except with wind and solar, you know where the price of the of the fuel is. It's always going to be the same, mm -hmm. and so there's a level. The time element is a lot shorter. Time element is a lot shorter. That's true, and so solar and wind wind up being very possibly much more attractive places to put money. Well, exactly <clears> that is happening. It's just beginning to happen, yeah. but. People like Forbes, <coughs> people like Wall Street Journal are starting to write about exactly that. Starting to. Five years ago, that would have been anathema. It yeah, that's right. It would not have and, been possible. to a certain extent, it still is. Forbes has got a lot of oh, yeah. articles if, appearing and it's saying this isn't going if, to work. If they write one article proposing this kind of stuff, in that same issue, there'll be five articles opposing it. Well, they've got, they've got their own advertisers. Their oh, own sure, right. You know. Not. That's what they do for a living. Yep. <coughs> okay. On the 29th of April, from the local uh, .de, which is a German website, we have this: German and international researchers have succeeded in converting water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight into kerosene. Bingo! I got that one. <coughs> In I a project it. that holds the possibility of producing a completely renewable I've got a picture of um, that. I showed it up before. Fuel. Now everybody, you know what it looks like. <laughs> well, now, this is a laboratory I thing. I don't know what it is, but you know what it looks like. No, I got a little <laughs> bit of information here. <coughs> Sorry well, what you're seeing there is not a solar cell. Yeah. But as you can see, it's very bright and they're concentrating yeah. sol sunlight on it. And it says here, the basic idea is to reverse the combustion process. What we do is take, soda, take carbon dioxide and water vapor and introduce energy to produce fuel. The German Aerospace Center's Institute of Combustion Technology in Stuttgart. That's where they make Porsches. <laughs> <laughs> the centerpiece of the four-year project, known as Solar Jet, is a solar reactor that use, uses focused sunlight to heat up a metal oxide. Water and carbon dioxide are then passed into the reactor, which we're looking at right now, at 700 C, which is 1300 F. It's pretty hot. It's hot. Where they spit up, I think the word is split up. <laughs> Probably. And form into a synthetic gas composed of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. The gas is then compressed and sent to shell, where it is converted into a hydrocarbon fuel similar to conventional kerosene. Interesting. Now the shell thing, these are, you know, in some, the, all of this science is based on earlier science. It oh, always absolutely. is. And the, the shell is probably using um, a, a catalytic system that's been used in the, in the um, fuel industry for a long time called the mobile process, which was introduced in the 1930s. <clears throat> this, however, is new. They're, they're, the, the idea of heating these things up using sunlight is is very interesting and this this stuff is new. A lot of people yeah. are looking at alternatives to electrolysis. Yes, and they're popping up right and left. Right. With all, this is one of them. The Navy's got one going. Yep. And they look for the same reason. They want to get fuel out of it. They want to get fuel out of it. It's very interesting to see this develop because it means basically <clears throat> this is this is yet another of those processes that takes the output of the of the of the po fo fossil fuel plant and creates fuel with it, which could then be used by the fossil fuel plant. It almost sounds like uh, an eternal motion machine where the carbon <laughs> atom just goes round and round and round. And first it's but burned. there's and sunlight going into There's it. sunlight, and it's, you look at that, you can see. There's a lot of sunlight. There's a lot of sunlight. And 1,300 degrees, when I was a, when I was a young whippersnapper and my hair looked like Ron Weasley's because it was kind of orangey red, <laughs> um, I used to work in a chemical plant where I was operating kilns, and 1,300 degrees was one of the cooler temperatures. The lowest we had was 50, 1,150, but 1,300 was glowing a fairly nice red, is, yeah. and um, it was, you know, I used to, I used to put uh, trays full of crucibles into these things, and I just, I just take the tray, put it on, and shove it in. And the only protection on my hand was a pair of garden gloves. Mm -hmm. But that's all I needed at that temperature, unless mm -hmm. I was actually going to be touching something that was that yeah, hot. Yeah, you would put something in the oven. Yeah. 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 And it was, it was 
it was, uh, 1,300 sounds like it's a lot, but it's not that hot. We did 2,300. That's hot. That made you feel like you were getting a sunburn if you were five feet away from it when the door opened. Okay. <clears throat> Green Mountain Power. This from Green Energy Times. You ever hear of that? Um, Green Mountain Power has announced that under a new revenue sharing agreement stemming from the sale of Vermont Yankee in 2002, GMP will receive as much as $17.8 million. The money will be directed to GMP customers in the form of lower rates. This is uh, all over the news right now. Yeah. We're hearing it on radio. And yeah. It's, it's a deal they made a long time ago. Yep. And I don't think anybody expected something like this to happen, but we happen to have had a really cold winter. Yep. Energy made a lot of money. Yep. And Green Mountain Power is entitled to some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's hope that we can Stranger. get enough money to go party. <laughs> it would be nice to be able to have but a barbecue. What Green Mountain Power has said is they're going to use it to reduce your bills. <clears throat> So they're not pocketing the difference. They're uh, well, spreading it out. Yeah, and they have other money coming in and other pl uh, from other sources that are also being distributed. And some of that is going to communities mm -hmm. um, with the idea that, you know, that could be used for uh, possibly financing some community power or, mm -hmm. or um, uh, efficiency, um, getting efficiency systems into, into homes and so forth. Efficiency is still the best way. Efficiency, the one thing about efficiency, though, is that you can't go 100% of the way on efficiency. <laughs> you really can't. You know, but yeah. it really, it is, it is very important. It, it's really hard to heat your house with solar and, and provide yourself electricity with solar if your house is uninsulated leaking. and leaking like a sieve. Yeah. So, you know, you've got you to gotta do a little bit of everything. But... One of the things that I've been reading about, and in fact I wrote an article about it for Green Energy Times, which was the source of this particular article, um, <clears throat> is what's called a passive house. And in a passive house, which is not passive solar, right. a person, the house is heated, heated by the people in it, by the people in it <laughs> doing their daily stuff. I mean, you know, uh, in a house that is that well provided for in terms of efficiency, insulation, windows yep. being insulated and sealed and so forth. And you have to have air exchange in there, which has to go through a heat exchanger. A hundred watts of power is substantial. And a hundred watts is, well, I give off more than a hundred watts. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Uh, Especially uh, when you're talking. And yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really kind of amazing. You can invite me to your home for dinner and I will heat it up for you in the... <laughs> Okay, let's get off of that one. Um, n on the same day from Reuters, we had this. Lower natural gas prices and stagnant growth in the electric demand will lead to a loss of 10,800 megawatts. Now, that's the equivalent of about 11 nuclear power plants uh, of nuclear uh, generation operation. They are saying that much... Um, being being lost in nuclear generation. This is about 10% of the total capacity of all nuclear plants in the United States. So they're saying about 10 nuclear plants will close down. By the end of the decade, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, and I've already warned people not to take their numbers too seriously, mm -hmm. but um, it, it's worthy of note when they say something. It's, it, you, it's just that you have to think, is this really true? Um, Ten nuclear plants closing down by, the, by 2020 or 2021, depending well, upon what Isn't there about you, five already scheduled to close? I don't know how many are scheduled to yeah. close. I know that there's uh, Oyster Creek is scheduled to close. And I know that Exelon has said that it's got about five that it's thinking about closing. Yeah. And I don't think Entergy has said what they were planning on doing, but I would not be at all surprised if they closed the Pilgrim plant. I wouldn't either. Because, uh, honestly, between you and me and anybody watching on television, I think the Pilgrim plant is in worse shape than, than Vermont Yankee was. It could very well be. And these decisions aren't being made because people are protesting. No, if, I don't think if so. If there's any culprit, it's natural gas. Well, it's natural gas... 
but I think they're looking at the natural gas thing, and if they're being realistic, which they might not be doing, what they would say is, okay, natural gas has, has punched us a few times and we're, and we're hurting. But the problem is, even when the price of natural gas goes up, the problem isn't going to go away because natural gas is starting to get hurt by wind and solar. Mm -hmm. So wind and solar are going to come in and it's going to be closing nuclear power plants. So they got one <clears> two <throat> punch from natural gas. And the third and one. They fell down and now they're getting up again. Yep. And wind and solar is going to whack them. I think so. Down. Yeah, I think that's the case. And I don't know how much, you know, the, uh, the other thing, of course, is that we've got um, James Hansen and other scientists saying that we need nuclear power in order to stop global warming. And I will just disagree with them on that because... There are alternatives. There are alternatives. The alternatives have been shown to be workable. And nuclear power takes a long time to build. Even those mini plants they're talking about bringing in, when they're talking about tiny nuclear plants, they're talking about something that is big. And okay, you can put the plant on a truck, but so what? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the problem with those things is they still have to be cited, they still have to be licensed, they still have to be permitted, they still have to get local approval, they still have to go through a whole bunch of things, and the first one to come out w cannot come out before 2022. And that's going to be the pilot project. Mm -hmm. And then after that, what's going, to ha what's going to develop? We have to be putting those things in if we're going to go to mini plants at a rate of one a month from 22, 22 on to have any real impact on, on uh, energy, on climate change. And by the time, by 2050, and by that time, I think we, we're going to have, you know, the UN report, the IC, uh, the IC, uh, IPCC report, basically one of the scenarios that they, that they had on there says that we will be in a period of profound negative carbon emissions by 2060. And honestly, I think that'll happen before 2060. Mm -hmm. because I think it's kind of got to happen. It's going to have to happen, but I think that it will because of the nature of the things, which means that these nuclear power plants are going to be answering a problem that we won't have by mm -hmm. the time they come mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. And they're expensive. But are, <clears throat> how would I say this? Are they real now, or are they just still an engineer's dream? They're, they're still an engineer's dream. The DOE is putting a couple, I think, two billion, a billion dollars into, into developing the first ones. The first one has not yet been mm -hmm. built. They are said to be foolproof, but if you look at the, at the projections of the nuclear industry, um, I think basically what they mean by foolproof is foolproof unless some fool gets a hold of it. <laughs> and this I was trying to come up with something <laughs> much like that. <laughs> really, I mean, just think about this for a second. 480 nuclear generators have gone online, nuclear reactors. Of those, 12 have melted down. That's 2.5% of all of them that have come online have melted down. Why? Because their calculation fails to account properly for human error. Yeah. Where is the human error? Well, one place you can have human error is in, in the design phase where you're trying to design a, a foolproof reactor. So what does fuel, foolproof mean? It does not mean foolproof. It means yeah. foolproof unless some fool unless was involved. Fool and it's not just the design of the reactor, it's the siting. I mean, a good example of what can go wrong, there are two reactors in Wisconsin. And I could be wrong about this, but if I'm wrong, it's not by much. My recollection is that those two reactors are at a distance from the front lead edge of the Pashtigo fire that is less than the distance that was the greatest distance jumped by the Pashtigo fire. I don't know the Pashtigo fire. The Pashtigo fire happened the same day as the Chicago fire, but it was in Wisconsin. <clears throat> and it just wiped out whole villages, everybody died. And wow. it was about two-thirds of the size of the state of Connecticut. Everything burned down. And the biggest barrier that it is known to have jumped is Green Bay. Mm -hmm. Now, Green Bay is 10 to 20 miles across. Mm -hmm. So it jumped a minimum of 10 miles, but it is possible that the Peshtigo fire jumped Lake Michigan. 
Wow. Because there was a similar fire the same on day the other side. In, on the other side. And this, they know that it jumped huge distances because among the other things that were found was the sign for a um, hardware store or a general store that was in a village that was completely burned down. Now, the sign still existed, but it was many miles from where the, the village had been. <clears throat> so it and got the, blown there. It got blown there, and they're saying at, in the process of getting blown there, it must have gone high enough to put the fire out that was burning on it. Mm -hmm. So it, it probably went up to 30,000 feet and fell. Okay, so here are two reactors, which by law you cannot put them in a site unless uh, it, it meets any it, safety, safety any natural disaster that happened in that area in the last hundred years. And they were closer to that fire, I think, than one side of Green Bay is to another. And Nobody's looking at that one. No one's looking at that. You know, it's kind of like the, 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 the uh, tsunami of 1896, which was just as bad as the one of 2011. But they didn't pay attention to that when they put in the p power plant at Fukushima. There this is, is where it is today. Oh, wow. And all of that structure that you see in there is just covering up. Yeah, well, they and The have reason to. why this even came up in the news is that's about reaching the end of its lifetime, and they're about to make a change. They're going to build a permanent tomb fort. Yep. That sounds like typical human And Chernobyl hubris. is in Ukraine. Yes. And so they're wondering whether they're going to be able to do it because the Russians might prevent it from happening. Having caused the first disaster, they may cause another one. Okay, um, now where were we? Well, you were talking about mini nuclear plants. Yeah, but I, that wasn't out of the news. This was the, I was reading that Reuters thing about nuclear power plants being closed down. And we're uh, going yes, to the are. 30th of April. A key part of Obama's the Obama administration's green policy received surprisingly strong Supreme Court support over efforts to curb air pollution. A six to two majority of justices, this is a I read that one. pretty yep. wide majority of justices, issued a decision upholding federal agency rules to control coal-fired power plant emissions from 28 states. This is, this is emissions crossing state lines. It's something yes. that is important to Vermont because the damage that has been done to Vermont by coal emissions from Ohio and Pennsylvania and New York and, I mean, the mercury that we've got in our, in our waterways is because of coal. I've got a summary here. Okay. A 6-2 majority of justices issued a decision upholding federal agency rules to control coal-fired power plants emissions from 28 states. It was a rare environmental victory in a conservative majority court that has in recent years generally cited against the federal government's nationwide clean air policies. And what it said is the highlights were that the justices gave surprisingly strong support to the president's green policies. The 62 majority upholds rules controlling coal fire plants emissions from 28 states. And as you mentioned, cross, with the emissions crossing state lines, that's the whole basis of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the whole Ohio River plants right. with huge mile-high stacks, yeah, and the emissions weren't bothering anybody locally, but they were coming down in Rhode Island. Yeah, <laughs> and, and uh, what the coal industry has been saying for about the last two years is that if this particular ruling came, which it has now, it would mean that about a third of the coal plants in the United States would have to close. And that is going to change the structure of electricity, electricity costs, and so forth. I think you better run that one by me again. That, they said that a sounds third, like a, a, a third, lot, to, to, uh, a huge mouthful right there. That's right. A third of the coal-burning plants in the United States would close, and the others are going to have to have emissions controls put on. Which this is going to be very expensive. Expensive, and it's going to raise the cost of power. It's going to raise the cost of power, and it's going to make things like solar power and, and wind power much more attractive. Mm -hmm. both to communities and to individuals and, of course, to utilities. Um, although I think the utilities are not as well positioned for 
particularly for solar, as individuals. Individuals mm -hmm. can make, mm -hmm. you know, a difference with solar. They, it's hard for, well, for the, utilities. The, the utilities are starting to get into it. They I mean, sure are. some very large solar plants. Right. Being and I think that in many places we're, we're going to be seeing uh, community wind farms. You yes. know, the, the, the Greensburg, Kansas comes to mind. They've got their own community wind farm. Okay, we're after 12 o'clock as we are taping this or recording this, not with tape. And so I think we, we've got four more th items to deal with here. We should get to them. The American wind industry continues the construction boom that started in 2014 with m more than 13,000 megawatts of wind energy projects under construction at the end of the first quarter. That's kind of amazing. That's a third of all, it's more than a third of all power construction in the United States presently going on is wind. wind. Now, trailing that is natural gas, which is going to take a lot longer to come online. To come online, yep. And during the time that comes online, there's going to be more wind coming on. And in third place is solar. So I think we're seeing a point here where renewable power is, is really starting, it may dominate 2014. It'll be interesting to see what the final numbers are. Um, a new that was from Alt Energy Mag, and the thing, by the way, that before that about about the justices was from CNN. You can get to these at geoharvey.wordpress.com, or you can go also to um, Green Energy Time uh, GreenEnergyTimes.org or .net to get it because they're the daily mm -hmm. up updates are there. A new report from Oak Ridge National Laboratory estimates that there is a potential for over 65 gigawatts of new hydropower development across more th uh, than 3 million rivers and streams in the United States. That's the one we talked about already. We yep. talked about that earlier, but they're talking about what's called stream reach. Exactly. And the, I read the report as far as I could before mm -hmm. I came in today, mm -hmm. and I was unable to find out what, what stream reach <laughs> is. It may be what James Perkins was talking about in the microhydro, where you're just taking water from one place and putting it in another a few hundred yards away. Or it may be, it may be something else, but the, the pictures that well, they had... Look up at the map there. Yeah. The pictures yeah. they had in the report showed weirs, from, from not dams. So okay. I, okay. I'm not sure exactly how this all fits. Well, if you take a look at those maps, they're not counties. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out what they are, and I suspect that a stream reach, and this I'm just guessing, but I suspect a stream reach is something like a watershed. Yes, I would think and that's the case. And these areas that you see there have been defined as a stream reach of right. a certain river. Right, right. It's watershed. Yeah, that's what it looks like. And it looks like, yeah, and there's significant power. Uh, it looks like some of it is in Bennington County. Western Vermont yeah. and northern Maine. Right. Northern New Hampshire, northern yeah. Maine. Right. Not much around here. A little bit around here, but yeah. Okay. And moving on. Um, China, this is today's news, today being the 1st of May. China, May, Day. May, Day. May Day. China added nearly 40% less coal and gas-fired power capacity in the first quarter than it did a year, to, year ago, mainly due to stronger pollution controls and slower economic growth, according to a senior government advisor. They're starting to get their act together. Well, you know, I, this goes back some distance. They can't be doing this just because the premier said that he was declaring war on 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 air pollution, which happened about a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, this goes back some ways. I don't know how far, but I think they've. I th you know they're, they're, the amount of the amount of um, renewable power that's going in in China is just astonishing. It's so yeah. big. They are for every for every three megawatts that we're putting in, they're putting in four. Is that all? Well, you know, this is the United States versus China. China has, has the lead yeah. when it comes to renewable power. And the reason they've been opening uh, coal-burning plants is because they have, <clears throat> ha 
had a, a rapidly expanding economy. It was growing at 7%, 8% per year. And um, people, are, people are making more money. Individual workers in many places are making more money, and they are demanding more for mm -hmm. that money. And they mm -hmm. want to have lights in their houses, and they want to have heat, mm -hmm. and they want to have mm -hmm. all kinds of things. But the Chinese in the past had been giving people as, a, as a, a, an incentive to live in certain places, free coal, for example. So they've got a lot of coal-burning plants that are just heating houses. Hmm. And apartment buildings, mm -hmm. and they've got a they've got a lot of change that has to be done, but their their air pollution in China is so bad that seven year olds are coming down with lung cancer of a type that is usually associated with uh, cigarette smoking, and they aren't smoking. Wow, you know this is bad. This yeah. is really really bad. Well, several times I've shown pictures of various cities yeah. in China. And you can't really see. Yeah. Well, you can see the atmosphere. Yeah. And everybody's walking around with masks. Yep. And it's not just China. Unfortunately, it's other places too. My son Jeff, who lives in Kenosha, married a Vietnamese girl in in Saigon. Mm -hmm. um, I'm told that the people there call still call it Saigon. Mm -hmm. But um, Susie went over and, and for the wedding, and she said that the people are really. They're lovely people. They're very friendly. They love Americans in Saigon. Interesting. Yeah. And she said half the people were walking around with masks because of the number of two-stroke um, motor scooters they were going around mm -hmm. with, which were really polluting. And um, <laughs> about half think the, about them anymore. Yeah, half the people with masks uh, had American flags on the masks. <laughs> and... You know, she said the people, she said everybody there smiled at her, except for one person who came from um, Hanoi. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. But um, nonetheless, I think, they would, I think they'd like to have good relations with the United States, but, you know, the air pollution that they've got in many of these places is really bad. Um, and finally, Platts confirmed CSX Corporation's train that exploded in Lynchburg, Virginia. Do you have a picture of this? I got that one. Yeah, I got oh, that man, here. this is sad. Of course, it didn't kill as many people as were killed in that horrible thing in, in Canada. Forty-seven people or something were killed in that. Yeah, the train picture I have, it was a small one to begin with, and I haven't built, I haven't expanded it. They, the, the report that I read said that the, the firefighters decided just to let the fire burn. Um, and I think part of that was probably because the, the oil from the train had spilled into a waterway. There, there's and the waterway. by letting it burn, they were able to remove much of what had gone on to the waterway. Well, and, that sort of makes sense, really. Yeah. And the, the um, I think it was 14 cars that derailed. Something read. like that. And uh, I, it looked to me from the pictures that I had seen like maybe one car had exploded. <clears throat> maybe it was more than that. I don't know. But well, you can most see of them had picture, not. The, the water's burning. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, this is, this is um, uh, stuff that had come. The, um, yeah, this had been sweet crude obtained by hydraulic fracking in North Dakota's Bakken Shale Basin. CSX CEO Michael Ward has also confirmed this to Bloomsburg. This is from the DeSmog blog. And again, we're, we're at a point here where we have to ask a question about this fracked oil because it explodes in, in, in um, accidents, which normal uh, crude oil does not do. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the reason is because this stuff apparently fizzes like soda water when it's jo uh, jolted around. Well, there's, there's hydrocarbons dissolved in it. It is yeah. like, it's carbonated. Yeah, except with hydrocarbons. Except that the it's not CO2, it's, it's hydrocarbons. propane and methane yep. and butane and you name it, tane. And <clears throat> this stuff is dangerous. And one of the things that happened was that Somebody down there in Virginia was saying, why in the world was this going through Lynchburg? Mm 
Well, there's an answer right here. They're yeah. bringing it to Yorktown. Yeah. Where now, they're getting ready to build a facility to export it. Right. And one of the things they said in one of the articles that I read was it could have gone through Richmond. Yep. And this accident could have happened in Richmond. Yep. And so how do you deal with stuff that like this that can explode if it derails when it's when it's in a in a major city? And that's a serious problem. That's what happened in Canada. I forget the name of the community in Canada where that happened. Do you remember, Tom? There was just mentioned one here that happened in uh, I think it was Virginia. Can no, North Dakota, Castleton, North Dakota. Oh, okay. Same thing happened after Burlington Northern Santa Fe freight train carrying back and one exploded in Castleton, North Dakota. The one that happened in Canada was in Quebec. It was just north of Vermont. Right. I don't <clears> but remember it, the name of the town, but it, it, it killed, destroyed it. It, it killed a large number of people. It destroyed the town. And, and it was just because a train um, had been stopped and the uh, brake failed to yeah. hold. And it rolled downhill. And it rolled downhill. And it came to a curve in the line and it was going too fast and jumped the, jumped the, the track. Accidents happen. And here is, a, here is a, a material that basically explodes in the, in the case of an accident. And it's going onto the train tracks. It's being conducted around the, around the country. And the question that I've got is, do we need it? And the answer I've got for that is no, we don't need it. We're better off without it. One of these, one of these uh, sentence paragraphs here has a question. Was it going to increase the likelihood that they would complete the pipeline because these trains are blowing up right and left? Well, the pipeline can blow up. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it, and Absolutely. the argument in favor of the pipeline has been, well, we need a pipeline because the trains can blow up. Yeah. But I don't, the, the projection that I read on the pipeline was that it would produce 50 leaks per year. Well, somewhere right now, I think, I know it's in Alaska, the pipeline leaking. It's been leaking for a couple of three weeks, but nobody saw it. Yeah. And it's spraying, apparently spraying the oil up in the air, which is getting dispersed by the wind. Oh, my goodness. And it's all over the ice. It's still icy wherever this is happening. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a, a golden mist all over the wind. Like I said, it, nobody noticed it was there. Somebody happened to be looking at Google Earth or something like that and said, hey, what's that? And, oh, we got a hold of the pipeline. <laughs> That's sad. Well, I mean, one would I've, think I, they would know there was a reduction of pressure in that pipeline. It doesn't have to have a big reduction in pressure to produce a big local effect. No. I mean, if you're, if you're producing, if you're losing a gallon a minute, you're, you're doing serious damage. I read once that a quart of oil will pollute 5,000 gallons of water. And I think I've heard something like that. That blows the mind. Well, you know, I mean, and especially when you consider that, for example, when I was a kid, or possibly a little earlier than when I was a kid, they used to spray swamps with oil yeah, to yeah. keep the mosquito keep population. Keep the mosquitoes down. <laughs> I lived in a uh, community where they used to pour oil on a road to keep the dust down. It's yes. Dirt roads. Yeah. yeah. I don't know when they stopped doing that, but I don't think it was all that long ago. It, I don't think it was either. And we welcomed it. You know? Yeah. Well, it kept the dust down. And you get all this dust. And, uh, <clears throat> it turned the dust. Made it, it made it almost like, like a macadam. Yeah. And it turned what dust did exist into something that was highly toxic. And I hear somebody coming in. I think it's time for us to go. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining us. This is the end of our line. I hope everybody has a chance to watch Carol Levin and, and Dave Bonta and Ken Azar as they join us in the previously uh, recorded segment. That I, I wouldn't be surprised if that doesn't get spun off and you can, you can look at it separately on the web. I would hope. It was a good yeah, show. It was a good show. Yeah. Something so, we should see. Yeah. So we will say goodbye. And... Um, See you next time.